So as Anya said, I'm going to be talking about post-quantum signature schemes today. In particular, I'm going to talk about a proposal that we have for a new signature scheme. This is joint work with uh, a lot of people. It's a group of eight of us who've been working on this together. Um, so uh, to begin with, um, what is post-quantum cryptography? So the idea is, uh, we all have known for a while, that a sufficiently powerful quantum computer can break a lot of uh, the hard problems that our crypto relies on. So it can factor numbers, it can compute discrete logs. Um, so that's, that's going to break essentially all of our known public key crypto, all of our encryption schemes, key exchange, um, uh, signatures. Um, so for example, in the setting of signatures that I'm going to be talking about, that breaks RSA, that breaks DSA, that breaks ECDSA. Um, so the idea of post-quantum uh, cryptography is maybe we should try to design schemes that are going to be secure even once we have these quantum computers available. So these are schemes that should be able to run on a classical machine, because we're not all going to have quantum computers, but they should remain secure even against an adversary who does have a quantum computer. So the question is, why now? I mean, right now we only have quantum computers that have a couple of qubits at a time. It's not clear how to scale this up. Maybe we won't ever be able to scale it up. Should we even bother thinking about this problem? And I'm going to argue that, yes, we definitely should, and that's because designing and deploying cryptography is a long, slow process. So we have to come up with assumptions that we think might hold against a quantum adversary. We have to design schemes based on them. We have to then take that from the pure theory to a, a more applied point of view and come up with candidate parameters that we think might be secure against a quant reasonably sized quantum adversary. Then we have to try to analyze and attack these schemes to see if the assumptions we make actually hold. Um, then finally, when we've settled on some schemes that we think are secure, we're going to want to try to optimize them as much as possible so that the overhead that we're taking from moving to this post-quantum world is as small as possible. And finally, once we've settled on schemes, we've got you know, the crypto down pat, we still have to implement them and deploy them in the real world, which is its whole another set of, of, of uh, time-consuming tasks. So I'm going to argue that if we think there's some possibility that we're going to have quantum computers that are reasonably sized in the next 20 or 30 years, we should start working on this process now. And really, right now, we're essentially it's somewhere between steps one and two. Um, OK, so great. I've convinced you we should come up with post-quantum schemes, hopefully. Um, so how are we going to do this? I mean, we said. All these, the assumptions we're used to working with, factoring discrete logs are broken. What, what kind of problems can we assume are still hard? So there have been a series of different types of assumptions that, that, that people think uh, may be hard, uh, even given a quantum computer. So we don't know good quantum attacks. Um, so several of the main classes of, of problems, there's lattice-based problems. Uh, there's problems based on supersingular isogenies, so hardcore number theory. There's code-based problems, multivariate polynomial solution problems. Um, and then there's some of our standard uh, symmetric key building blocks, which surprisingly, we don't know uh, significantly better ways of attacking with a quantum computer than with uh, a standard classical computer. And that last bullet is what we're going to be talking about today. So um, we'd like to design post-quantum signature schemes. Right now, you know, we're using easiest DS day often, which is great. It gives us small keys. It gives us small signatures. It gives us relatively fast signing and verification. But we know it's insecure against a quantum adversary. So the question is, you know, when we move to a post-quantum world, is there anything comparable that, that we can use in place? And we know we need to, to study the assumptions and attacks, but even on an efficiency level, uh, sort of what's out there. And I'm going to argue that, that right now, there isn't really anything that that quite matches what we get from, say, ECDSA. Uh, and that's still going to be true after this talk, unfortunately. But, so the closest we get is maybe the stateful hash-based signatures. Uh, but they have the downside that they're stateful, which some applications that just doesn't work. Other applications, it, it means uh, it doesn't fit well into sort of existing systems. Um, so what I'm going to present today is uh, a signature scheme that's just based on symmetric primitives. So we need a hash function, uh, or maybe a hash function and a block cipher is actually what we're going to use. And concrete, really, what we're going to uh, use in the scheme that we propose is a shake and a new block cipher that we call low MC. Um, although, in general, you, we could instantiate our signature using any hash function and, and block cipher. 
Um, in terms of efficiency, it'll be sort of on the same order as, as everything else. So not perfect, but not terrible, hopefully. Um, but I think what's nice about this is it's a, a new approach and a different approach from even previous hash-based signature schemes. Um, so it's not using this sort of Merkle tree type approach that, that existing hash-based signatures uh, use. So that's nice because it gives us a diversity of approaches, which is always good in case something ends up getting broken. Um, but it's also nice because it's a, it's a new approach, so it may be something that it has a lot more space for optimization. Okay, so uh, now I've given you the high-level idea of, of what Picnic is and, and why it's going to be cool. Um, oh, I should say our scheme is called Picnic. So, <laughs> um, so I'm going to start out by giving a, sort of an overview of Picnic and how it's uh, um, constructed and sort of the intuition behind it. And then I'll talk about uh, performance uh, benchmarks that we did and some of the example settings that we looked at. Okay, so our basic approach is going to be sort of similar to like a DSA, EC, DSA type approach. You can think of the public key as going to be basically a function of the secret key. So you can think for, for this slide and the next couple slides of the function as being a hash function. It'll actually be something different from that in the end. Um, and then a signature is going to be a way that the signer is going to prove that he knows the secret key that corresponds to this public key. And of course, the signature has to you know, include a message somewhere. So you could think of the, the message as being sort of a nonce. It's a way of, of um, sort of randomizing or, or, or changing some of the random values in the signature. Uh, so of course, if the signature is going to be a proof that the signer knows the secret key, it's also going to have to be a, uh, something that hides the secret key. Otherwise, if we leak the secret key, there's no point. So it's going to be what we call a zero knowledge proof. So something that's convincing, but that doesn't reveal the secret. Uh, so, uh, that's great, and as I said, that's the way a lot of signatures uh, can, be, can be viewed. Um, but what we're interested here is in a post-quantum uh, signature scheme. So what we need is a, this hard-to-invert function f, and the signature scheme should both be secure against a quantum adversary. And that's, of course, the challenge. And still moderately efficient. So, um, I'll, I'm going to talk about these two building blocks in turn. So, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the zero-knowledge proof system. So, the proof system that we start out with is something called zk boo for zero-knowledge for Boolean circuits, uh, that was introduced uh, by Giacomelli, Madsen, and Orlandi uh, in 2016. And so, basically, it's, it's uh, a zero-knowledge proof system that's tailored for proving statements about circuits. Um, so what I mean by statements about circuits is that you have a public circuit, you know, so a bunch of AND and XOR gates, uh, you know, a bunch of input wires on the left, output wires on the right, and you can think of this as, in, in our setting, uh, the hard-to-invert function F. So this is maybe the code for your, your favorite hash function. And then uh, in this proof system, the prover wants to be able to prove that he knows some set of inputs, such that when you evaluate the circuit on these inputs, you get a particular public set of outputs. Um, and in general, that's, you know, you can't necessarily look at a circuit and a set of outputs and say if there even exists a set of, of inputs that would, would map to those outputs. That would be, like, say, finding a pre-image of a hash function or something like that. Um, so in our setting, in the signature setting, the prover is going to be the signer. This set of inputs is the secret key. Uh, the circuit is this hard-to-invert function f, uh, which we're calling a hash function for now. And the output value should be the public key. So the... Um, Right, so this is exactly what ZKBU allows us to do, and the nice thing about it is that it doesn't use any number theoretic assumptions. It's just based on hash functions and a pseudorandom number generator. And the cost is going to depend on the number of AND gates in the circuit and the security level, of course. Um, and a tiny bit on the number of XOR gates, but mainly the AND gates. Okay, so I'm going to try to give you sort of a vague flavor of how this works. This is not actually how the scheme works. It's just to give some intuition so that it's not all complete magic. Um, so I'm going to start with this very toy example where we have a very simple circuit, which is just an XOR gate. So we have two uh, inputs, A and B. We have an output, uh, C. And the prover wants to prove that uh, he knows A and B such that AX or B equals C. So obviously that's trivial, you know, anybody could find such an A and B, but it's at least going to give us an idea of how these schemes work. Um, and we're going to say this should be hiding in the sense that the, uh, 
the verifier who's checking this proof shouldn't be able to tell which, uh, which A and B you chose. So, you know, if C is one, was it a one and zero or zero one? Something like that. Okay, again, obviously trivial and just a toy example. So what I'm going to describe right now is an interactive protocol. So two parties are going to send messages back and forth, and we'll talk later about how to squish it all into one message that the prover can send. Okay, so how does this work? So step one, we're going to take each of those inputs, so the A and the B, and we're going to break them into two random shares. So we'll pick uh, random their bits, so random bits A1 and A2 uh, that XOR to the bit A, and same thing for B. Uh, so that's step one. Step, and the nice thing about this, I should say, is that if I show you just A1 and B1, that tells you nothing about A and B, because uh, A2 and B2 could be anything to explain any A and B. So the next step is, this is a little hand wavy, but we're going to essentially try to uh, evaluate our uh, circuit, but just using uh, one set of the shares. So we're going to XOR together A1 and B1, get C1. We'll XOR together A2 and B2, get C2. And then finally, we're going to do what I call committing to the shares. So we're going to pick some random strings, which will just act as sort of extra randomness to hide things. And we're going to hash A1, B1, and this random string R, and A2, B2, and this random string R2. And these sort of fixed what A1, B1, and A2, B2 are, um, but because of the randomness, they don't actually reveal the bits. Um, so then the the C1, C2, and the two hashes are going to get sent over to the verifier. The verifier picks um, one set of shares, so either one or two, at random. Say he picks one. And then the prover is going to send back uh, basically the, the values, that, uh, the, the number one shares. So the A1, B1, and the, the randomness that he used at the commitment. Um, oops, that's funny. OK, so now the, the verifier is going to verify that uh, the two shares actually XOR to C, the C1 and C2 that were sent. Uh, he's going to verify that C1 was computed correctly, so A1 XOR B1 equals C1. And then he's also going to check, and this is missing from the slide, unfortunately, that the hash is com correctly computed, so that H1 is actually the hash of A1, B1, and R1. Okay, so that's uh, an interactive, I'm claiming this is an interactive proof. Uh, so why is this convincing? Again, totally in a hand-wavy way. Um, so you can sort of think of, of uh, two cases. So one is suppose that the prover actually computed the two hashes using A1, A2, B1, B2, uh, such that, that they sort of match up properly with C1 and C2. And C1 and C2 are correct. Then I'm going to argue that we're done. So if you plug it in and do a bunch of arithmetic, you see if I took A1 and A2 and I xor those together, we can call that A. If I take B1 and B2 and XOR those together, we'll call that B. Then those two things XOR together are eventually going to, uh, by these equations, have to give you C. So then we can say that that A and that B are actually values that XOR to C. Okay, so if he computed the hashes using values that would satisfy the checks, uh, then we know that the statement is true. If not, then we know that you know, one of either A1, B1, or A2, B2 don't satisfy the checks, and that means that with 50% probability, the verifier will pick one or two, whichever one is wrong, and catch the, the prover. Um, so the prover can cheat with only probability one half at most. Okay, so that's why it's sort of vaguely convincing. I mean, you still have a half percentage of cheating, but we'll talk about how to fix that later. Um, so next, why does it hide A and B? Uh, so we can look at what the verifier gets to see. Again, totally not formal. Uh, so he gets to see A1 and B1, but we argued that those are completely independent of A and B. Uh, he also gets to see H1. Well, that's a hash of A1 and B1, so that obviously leads, leaks nothing more. He gets to see C1, which is just A1, XOR, B1. Again, if A1 and B1 don't leak anything, then their XOR doesn't leak anything. He gets to see C2, which is the X, uh, public value C, XOR with C1. Again, shouldn't leak anything. And then the final thing he gets to see is H2, which is the hash that involves A2, B2, but because we include this extra sort of randomness value, we're assuming something strong on the, on the hash function, which is that um, if we hash with a, a random, large enough random number that the verifier doesn't know, the output will look random. Um, so that's roughly why, just looking at this proof, we don't learn anything about what A and B are. Okay, so that's sort of 
the very high level. Um, and just to say, if that looks at all familiar, secret sharing computation, um, to say something like multi-party computation, that's because it is entirely in inspired by multi-party computation. So there is actually um, a work that goes back to work of uh, Ishai Kushilevitz, Ostrovsky, and Sahai that is called MPC in the Head, which is sort of how to use MPC protocols um, for doing, say, zero knowledge. And uh, zk Boo is essentially a very optimized, uh, specialized protocol um, to make those ideas efficient. Um, right. So what that means is we can we can sort of use a lot of the tricks that that come out of MPC literature. So we can actually I just talked about XORs. We can also support ANDs. I'm not going to talk about how it's a little bit more complicated than XOR, which is why I didn't do it as an example. But we can do it. We can support multiple gates because proving something about a one gate circuit is not very interesting. Um, that's essentially just chaining uh, many of these gates together, beating the outputs of one gate into the inputs of the next. Um, we need to decrease the cheating probability because if we have a probability one half of catching the bad guy, that's not so good. Um, so we're, we can do that just by repeating the protocol many, many times with different random uh, values each time. And the chances that we catch them, the chances that they can get through all those iterations without getting caught are negligible. Uh, and finally, we can make this non-interactive. Um, using what's called the fiat Shamir heuristic. So basically the idea is that right now, uh, the verifier you know, first gets this message from the prover that has the hashes and the output shares, and then he chooses a random uh, share, either one or two, to, to, to request from the prover. And instead of having the verifier choose those himself, we can say we'll choose those using a hash function on all the messages that the prover has sent so far. And if we can say that the prover's chance of, of Cheating, uh, you know, after once he sent his first message, the prover's chance of, of not getting caught by a verifier is very, very tiny. Then we can actually say that even if the prover can sit there and come up with a first message and uh, try the hash function on it and see what the response is and see if he can respond and keep doing this over and over again, the chances that he will ever be able to find uh, a valid first message for which he can respond to the to the hash challenge are are very small. Uh, and just, I'm not really going to talk about it, but that's also where we include the signature message. So we'll include that in the hash that's used to compute the zero or one, which, uh, which thing the, the verifier or the prover is going to reveal. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the, the sort of under the hood bits of zk boo. So if, if that lost you, you can come back now because everything else is going to be at a higher level. Um, so. I was describing ZKBoo, what we actually use is, is something we call ZKBoo++, which is an optimized version of this, where we go through and look for values that the verifier can safely recompute, or things that we can represent with a small seed and just you know, have the verifier blow up um, as necessary. And doing all that, we managed to reduce the signature size by more than a factor of two. And the signature size is actually one of our bigger costs, so that makes a difference. And, and then we can analyze security in the random oracle model. So we also, uh, there's been some, some work looking at not just the random oracle model, but sort of the variant of the random oracle model that we might want to use in the presence of quantum adversaries, um, where you say that the, the sort of random looking hash function can be evaluated on quantum inputs. Uh, and so we also have a variant of a um, uh, proof uh, technique uh, proposed by UNRWA that uh, you can analyze in the quantum random oracle model. And it adds a little bit of overhead, but actually not as much overhead as just going back to the original ZK boost. So it's, it's still on the same order of magnitude. Okay, so that's the proof system that we're going to use. So in that uh, bit where the prover wants to prove that, that he knows the secret key that, that corresponds to the public key. The next question is, what f should we choose? So we need f to be hard to invert. Obviously, it's bad if we can get back the secret key just looking at the public key. And then we need the proofer. Uh, so the proofer signature size is going to depend on the number of AND gates in the circuit. So we want that to be as small as possible. Uh, so I was talking about f as being a hash function, but we can also look at block ciphers. Uh, the way we would do that is the public key would be just be a random message and then encryption under the secret key of that message. Um, so we looked at a whole bunch of uh, different block ciphers and hash functions, and you know, standard ones, AES, SHA-2, SHA-3, a whole bunch of other ones. And what we ended up finding worked the best for us uh, was something called LowMC. 
which gives significantly smaller uh, circuits than everything else. Um, so what that is, it's a new block cipher, uh, which was introduced in Eurocrypt 2015. Um, now they have an updated version on ePrint. It uses this sort of substitution permutation network design, but it's, it's uh, designed to be used sort of in crypto protocols, and the nice thing about it is that it's extremely par par parameterizable. So it allows you to, say, minimize the number of AND gates that you want to use to, to compute the thing, or minimize the depth uh, in terms of AND gates of your circuit. Um, it also allows for some sort of trade-offs between the number of AND gates and the number of XOR gates. Uh, you can sort of feed in different parameters for um, different block sizes and, and key sizes and, um, and for different security levels. Uh, right. Okay, so for our uh, application, we chose a particular set of low MC parameters that, that works really well. Um, one nice thing is that we only have one plain text ciphertext pair that's being revealed, and, and LoMC lets us take advantage of that. Um, okay, so that's it about our scheme. Now I'm going to talk about the performance. Uh, so we looked at three different parameter levels, basically each one uh, looking at, uh, say, 128 bits classical security, and then half that for quantum. Um, from that, we can get low MC parameters and the number of repetitions that we should use. And for everything we use, uh, for the ZK boot plus plus, we use uh, shake as both the hash function and the pseudorandom number generator. Um, and then you can see uh, first results of the signature and key sizes in bytes. So Fiat Shamir is the one that I said you can prove in, in the random oracle model or analyze in the random oracle model. The second line, the UR, is, is the quantum random oracle model version. So slightly stronger security claims, I guess. So you can see the signatures aren't super small, but they're still in the order of kilobytes, so not that bad. Um, we also uh, actually have a number of implementations. This one's on sort of a standard good um, PC, but we also looked at it on like an AMD processor and, and a, a less good PC. Um, and signature times and verification times are, are uh, small numbers of milliseconds. Um, in order to sort of look at uh, what picnic loop would be like if we wanted to use in the real world, we wanted to look at, at some of the places the signatures get used a lot. So in particular, we looked at uh, authentication for TLS. So we added picnic to the OpenSafe quantum library and used it to uh, implement um, open SSL in a web server. Um, we used it to create, so we ran experiments where we used it to create uh, X509 certificates that certify uh, picnic public keys. Um, and then we look at using those in uh, TLS 1.2 connections. So we retrieve a bunch of HTML files and look at how long it takes. Um, so what we did was we wanted to look at uh, a TLS protocol that's entirely um, post-quantum secure. So we looked at LWE-based schemes, so Frodo and uh, SIDH uh, scheme. And we looked at those both with RSA as the authentication method and then with PICNIC. And the overheads from uh, moving to RSA, from RSA to PICNIC that we saw were only like 1.4, 1.7, so not too bad. Um, and just to say, this is only looking at the client side latency. There's a lot more experimentation that you could do looking at, you know, what happens. Our servers were only running one connection at a time. Maybe they want to run multiple connections, looking at more realistic web traffic, a number of things. But at least it gives a vague idea that this is not going to be a, you know, a, a game killer um, in terms of size. Uh, let's see. And the other experiment that we looked at was uh, what happens if a, a CA wants to say store their their uh, picnic signing keys in a an HSM. So an HSM is a hardware security model. I think we module rather. I think we heard a little bit about this yesterday. It's a special hardware for storing keys and performing crypto operations uh, to guarantee that the keys never leave the hardware. Uh, so we found one of those that, that uh, uh, allows you to customize the crypto in it and uh, experimented with it. So we implemented key generation and signing, so the, uh, basically to simulate the CA generating their key and, and um, issuing signatures. And then we also implemented a protocol where the, uh, the, the um, HSM will receive a certificate signing request for an RSA key pair and issue a certificate. Um, and so these are the numbers that we got. Uh, there, it's a non-optimized implementation because it would have to be optimized for this particular hardware. Um, but this includes uh, the network time, forming the, the uh, signing request, sending it, getting the certificate back. 
And you know, so it's it's milliseconds and so not too bad. Um, okay. So just to wrap up, um, what we're proposing is a new post-quantum signature scheme that's just based on on uh, symmetric primitives, so a hash function and a hard-to-invert function. Concretely, we're suggesting shake and low MC. And these are both things that we at least don't know any way of attacking any better with a quantum computer than with a classical computer, or more than, than a small amount better. Um, it gives small keys, which is nice. Uh, signatures are slightly larger, but uh, still not too big, uh, and signing verification time is, is pretty moderate. Um, and the other, the, the nice thing to emphasize about our approach is that it's a new approach. Uh, it gives sort of a diversity of, of design options, and it also leaves a lot of opportunities for optimization. Uh, and in particular, there's, there's already been work uh, that appeared at CCS this year called the Jero that, that looks at uh, optimizing the way that that proof system works in the case where your circuits are bigger. So we might use that if we wanted to use SHA-3 or SHA-2 instead of low MC. And I'll stop there, but if you want any more information, you can ask me or uh, all of our uh, documentation and everything is up on this website. Thanks. Okay. We have a uh, bit time for one, two questions, if there are any. You can go to the mic. Uh, hi, uh, yes. very nice, uh, I have to say, very neat, neat idea. Um, I was actually surprised that the quantum random oracle version is uh, as such a small overhead compared mm -hmm. to, the, to the regular one. I mean, that's, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. Can you give us an intuition on how you select the, uh, the parameters for the UNRU transformation? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, we were actually surprised too, too at first. But so the issue is the way that the under transformation works, it's, it sort of asks you to uh, respond, to commit to responses for all, for all possible challenges, essentially, for many possible challenges. But the nice thing about here is we only have, well, in my example, two, but really in the actual scheme, three possible challenges. So we can just sort of commit to all of those, uh, all three of them. <laughs> in advance. Uh, so that's part of it. And then the other thing is that sort of the responses actually have a lot of overlap in, in the way the construction uh, okay. works. In the way, so we, we sort of uh, collapse the, the overlapped responses and, and just open the parts that you need for each proof. Uh, so it ends up, yeah. Uh, okay. Just because of the way that this proof system works, it ends up being a relatively small overhead. Can you also tell us how does it compare to Sphinx, for example, in terms of, uh, because I've seen you did some comparison with other uh, signature schemes in the TLS implementation. Uh, oh, yeah, so we actually just compared here with like a basic RSA scheme. So the issue is that we haven't, don't know the sort of the latest version of, of Sphinx after oh, the right. NIST okay. competition and everything, so I don't know if I want to comment too much. I would guess it's probably still a little bit slower, but there's, they've done a lot of optimization on theirs, and this is still brand new, and, and not, uh, there's, there's a lot of room for optimization. Um, but yeah, we haven't actually run, run the comparison with, with the latest versions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other question? It's from upstairs. Okay, then uh, let's thank Melissa again. <laughs>